you recently wrote about the fatal contradictions of China bashing. And I wanted to kind of do a, a maybe an overview and analysis of Cold War economics, which I feel like we are very much in the throes of. Uh, Janet Yellen was recently in Beijing uh, visiting with uh, top level officials in China and uh, not much has been coming out of these visits uh, from the United States side. Not much change, but there has been a lot of economic policy that the United States has leveled upon China, especially since the Trump era. Could you talk about maybe to begin the significance of these tariffs? Because the trade war with China that was begun under Donald Trump and continued under Joe Biden uh, has had significant consequences. Could you go over what those consequences are and maybe give an outline of the fatal contradictions of China bashing? Sure. Um, the first and probably the most important thing to keep in mind is that the United States policy as a nation vis-a-vis -vis the People's Republic of China is, is a split policy. Uh, a schizophrenic, even if you want, kind of policy. It is trying to do two opposite things at the same time. And if you keep that in mind, you'll understand the peculiar contradictions because it follows logically from when you try to do the opposite thing at the same time, it gets you into all kinds of twists and turns that people on the outside, perhaps imagining that you had a consistent policy, couldn't understand. So, so let me give you the, the starkly, and then we'll get into the, the details. The split is the following. For political reasons, having to do with the United States' position in the world economy that came out of World War II, in which you had what political scientists call a unipolar world, a world in which the United States emerged from World War II. No battles were fought here, with the exception of Pearl Harbor uh, at the beginning. Nothing happened that destroyed anything uh, on the mainland of the United States. Better than that, the Depression was overcome by the war because the war effort put back the unemployed into jobs, got the whole productive machine going. So the World War II ends, Germany's destroyed, Russia's destroyed, Japan's destroyed, uh, China's destroyed. The United States sits there uh, able, which it then does, to basically move in and become the new global hegemon, replacing uh, the nearest thing to it was the British Empire in the previous 100 or 200 years. And so the United States becomes dominant. And that domination left, uh, continued for the rest of the 20th century. Uh, but over the last 25 years, it didn't. I mean, you know, like all empires, it reached a peak and now it is in decline. I can go in in a few minutes, if you like, to all the economics of that decline. But that decline is terrifying to the American establishment that got used to the privileges, to the wealth, uh, to the power that came with being the global hegemon uh, throughout the 20th century. And then they got that extra boost in 1989 when the Soviet Union fell apart, Eastern Europe fell apart, and, and the enemy that had been declared the great enemy was gone. I mean, if you needed anything to kind of take your mentality over the top, and that's why you had at the end of the 20th century, uh, Fukuyama's story about the end of ideology, the end of history. Uh, Robert Heilbronner declared that a century of war between capitalism and socialism had now been decided. Capitalism won, socialism lost. I mean, that kind of mentality, left, right, and center, was really challenged over the last 20 years by the rise of China as an economic powerhouse. Uh, there's a single statistic that I use. I could use many, but there's one that captures kind of what I'm after. 
if you look at the world today, one of the statistics economists use is something called the GDP, gross domestic product. It's roughly a measure of the output of goods and services in an economy in one calendar year. And by comparing one country's GDP to another, you get a sense of their relative size, their footprint, if you like, in the global economy. Okay, just to give you an idea. Uh, last year, the GDP of Russia was about one and a half trillion dollars. The GDP of the United States was about 21 trillion dollars. In other words, to think of the world as a great struggle, and you hear that every day now, between the United States and Russia is silly in economic terms. There is no struggle, there is no contest, and there is no competition because you have David and Goliath with the one addition that David lost his slingshot. So there is nothing that can happen here. They can destroy each other with nuclear weapons, and that's important, but in terms of the economics, it's of no importance. Now the People's Republic of China, their GDP is about 17, 18 trillion dollars. That's serious. So in economic terms, if there's a struggle, if the United States is having trouble holding on to its dominant position, then the issue is China. It has nothing to do with Russia or Brazil or India or any of the others because their GDPs are tiny relative to the United States. People have to understand that because it now allows me to tell you the other side of the United States and China's relationship. Competing as the rising new economic powerhouse, embarrassing the declining old economic powerhouse. Okay, in the first 20, 25 years of this century, that's the period of time when the United States, having reopened its links to China with the Kissinger-Nixon events of the 1970s, we had a kind of open season. Huge numbers of American corporations invested in the People's Republic of China, traded with the People's Republic of China. You had enormously mutually profitable arrangements China could focus on being an export producing powerhouse because it had a partnership with Walmart who would sell everything the Chinese produced. China couldn't have done it without some way of getting all that stuff that they are so good at producing into the stores where Americans and Europeans buy. Walmart, Target, uh, they took care of that. They and it made, a, it made Walmart the biggest corporation in the United States. In many, so this is a mutually powerful. Okay, what that means is that for the last 25, 30 years, major American corporations, most of them, have had a wonderful, profitable time trading with and investing in China. China was the capitalist dream. It offered capitalists low wage, disciplined, educated labor and the fastest growing market in the world. No capitalist could afford to ignore that. If you dared, your competitors would get a jump on you because they went. So even if you didn't go at first, competition forced you to go shortly thereafter. Bottom line, split in America. All the major corporations want peace and a deal and mutual finances between the United States and China. They don't want a war. They don't give a flying you-know-what about Taiwan or anything else. On the other hand, there is the political, ideological sometimes captured with the phrase neocons or neoconservatives who are out there being the vanguard to, to try to stop 
what is happening, which is the decline of the United States relative to the rise of China. So they want the tariffs, they want the trade wars, they want all of that stuff. They got it halfway with uh, Trump, they got it a quarter of the way with Obama, and they got it another halfway with Biden. But it's always a quarter and a half because of this conflict. Right. Janet Yellen went to China, but in the two or three weeks before, Jamie Dimon, the head of the biggest bank in the United States, J.P. Morgan Chase, Elon Musk, and, and a dozen other big powerhouse economists went there and they didn't talk about Taiwan and they didn't talk about the Uyghurs or none of that or Hong Kong. They're doing business. And the Chinese, of course, know all of this. So their policy has basically been, as the world notices, when, when you get provoked by the, the neocons, you, you pretend it didn't happen. If it's particularly aggressive, you say something. If it's super aggressive, you do something. But it's mostly symbolic because the, the Chinese want what the American business community wants, which is profitable commerce. And the result is you're getting this bizarre theater where Janet Yellen is, is one of the people who tries, and she fails, but she tries to balance these two. So one day she's talking about the way the neocons want and lecturing uh, Xi Jinping or whoever else about how they should behave, which is, you know, trivial, annoying, and childish. And the next day, she's saying pretty much the opposite. We have to live together. We can work this out. Uh, the world is a big enough place for all. And you're going to see it back and forth, whether it's John Kerry or whether it's Blinken or any of the others, or for that matter, Biden. Uh, you know, the, and, and by now, they have a constituency, and that constituency has also to be pleased. Uh, the, the, the military industrial complex has a particular position. Uh, they don't want war, but they want perpetual trouble because that means they get the business. They can, you know, the defense has to be maintained. So when you put all that together, you get this schizoid uh, behavior of the United States, which is mostly either puzzling or ridiculous, depending on what country you're looking at. And I should mention, because it's important, that other parts of the world are acutely aware of all of this. They, they don't have the media that we have. They don't need to pretend that we're still the big, strong bully of the world that we were for the second half of the 20th century. Uh, they never were that, so they don't have to maintain that. And they don't have to maintain the fiction that the United States, and that's produ producing a growing gap between the concepts of what's going on in the United States and everywhere else. In Europe, for example, yes, you have a bunch of conservative governments that are very worried that the United States will abandon them. And they don't know quite how to handle that, so they are becoming more pro-American than they were before, trying to demonstrate, uh, don't abandon us. But right below the surface in Europe, in Germany, Italy, France, England, there's the business community that doesn't want any of this, that either wants to have access to China or wants to develop a Europe that is somehow able to be a player in a three-way relationship between China, Europe, and America, rather than be the junior partner of the United States. And the reality is that the tensions between the United States, which wants them to be, the Europeans, a junior ally, and a large portion of the Europeans who do not want that, you now have a very complicated situation, and American diplomacy has to somehow manage that, and that's not going real well either. And the attempt 
to to mobilize NATO and Europe in the war with uh, Russia in in Ukraine. That's not going well either because the Ukrainians are clearly unable to defeat Russia. That should have been obvious to anybody from the beginning, partly because one is a big, big, rich country and the other one is a small, poor. I mean, you know, it doesn't take rocket science and simply loading them up with weapons, particularly when the weapons are the kind of discard old weapons that the Europeans and the Americans have given them trying to imagine that on the cheap, with cheap weapons, this little country is going to be able to deal with Russia. It's childish. It's, it, it's, the, it's a mistake. And, you know, people don't make mistakes unless there's a reason. You've not explained anything by saying it's a mistake because it simply raises the question, why was that mistake made? You know, the United States has lost its wars. It, and, and this is a very serious business. It didn't win in Korea. It clearly lost in Vietnam. It clearly lost in Afghanistan. It did not win in Iraq. I could continue. And it's not winning in Ukraine now either. And these are signs that the rest of the world is looking at. And when you see that China did what every third world, what we used to call the third world country, Asia, Africa, Latin America, Their goal has been, all of them, to stop being poor countries, which centuries of colonialism condemned them to be, and to become economically well-off, middle-income, high-income. And really, very few have managed it. China, which was among the poorest in the world, has, has achieved it in unbelievably short amount of historical time. I mean, the industrialization of Europe took centuries. The industrialization of, of China took 30 years. And it's just incredible. And the rest of the world, looking about, looking for models, looking for allies, looking for technical expertise, of course, they now have a choice. They don't have to go to Europe or North America or Japan. They can go to the BRICS. They can go to... China and its allies, and nobody should be surprised that there are 15 or 20 countries that have either applied to join the BRICS or are in the process of doing so. I mean, it's a new economic system in the world. It's a new world economy. And pretending that that's not the case, acting as if we were back in 1970 or 80 or 90, that's not going to make it happen. And so there's this disconnect uh, that I tried to get at in that article between the reality and a bizarre mixture of pretense, theater, and denial here in the United States. Hmm. Well, well, you summarized all of this so well, and I definitely want to get more into the details of each of some of the points that you made. But one question I want to ask you, uh, Professor Wolf, is this. I was just in China, and people would ask me, why is it that American businessmen, American capitalists, why are they conducting better diplomacy than your politicians? Because you said it, Jamie Dimon was there, Elon Musk was there, you know, there were set, and, and that doesn't include also the European delegations that came with Macron and Olaf Scholz uh, just several months ago. And so this is the curious thing to me is that. We know now that the trade war, the sanctions, all of this on China alone, let's let's table maybe Russia and BRICS for a second, but just on China alone, they have that these policies have had consequences on US development, US profits, that the trade war itself has been pretty disastrous for American corporations and businesses. How is it then that these neocons, that the political side of this can somehow outweigh the, you know, given your economic perspective, especially your analysis of capitalism, how is it that these political forces seem to be uh, uh, overpowering the influence of maybe the business interests that do want to continue to do business with China? Uh, I don't think they're overpowering them. Uh, I I think they're in a, uh, I mean, your question still stands, but but it's more of a, 
an endless struggle uh, and neither side is able at least yet to dominate. Um, one of the reasons that there hasn't been, in my judgment, a, a peace agreement between uh, Russia and Ukraine to end this horrific uh, destruction of, of a country um, is because the two sides can't work that out in the United States. The neocons want to weaken Russia. Russia is a major ally of the People's Republic of China. Russia has a, one of the greatest military apparatuses in the world. Um, China needs that in, in their ally of the Russia. Everybody in the world who plays this game knows that. So what, to answer your question, the neocons being politicians, um, and I should mention to you, you know, I know them a little bit. I come from a, a background not so different from some of them. I mean, I know them. They understood long ago that their interest is not the same as the interest of the businesses. They resent those businesses. They resent that those businesses, in their, if you give them three martinis, what comes out of their mouth is that the American business elite is the ally of Xi Jinping, and they're very angry about it. That's how they, if, if you get them honest, that, that's how. So, they're, but they're not stupid. So here's what they've done. They've gone to the American enterprises and said, it, the big ones, if you support our neocon foreign policy, we will support you. And how is that to be done? We will use national security as the excuse to give subsidies to major uh, all the people who make um, computer chips. That's been a scandal. They've given them 60, 70 billion dollars in outright subsidies. Remember, these are people who believe in laissez-faire. Many of them are economists like me who have been teaching all their lives how the most efficient capitalist system is the one with the least amount of government intervention. They are now leading the charge for government intervention. That's not because they have had an epiphany ideologically. They have to do that because that entices the business community to be supportive of them. Look, here we have Democrats typically pushing away from corporations because they have to cultivate the image of being the political party of the working man and woman, they now have to get out there, embarrass themselves in front of unions, embarrass them, themselves in front of Bernie Sanders, AOC, and all of those people by giving huge subsidies on, on fake uh, national security grounds to corporations left and right, imposing tariffs, that create a protected market inside the United States for American producers. And then they dangle in front of them, just to make the thing as stark for you as I can, they dangle, you know, if we defeat Russia, if we overthrow Putin, then we will be able to divide up the whole of Russia into little Polands or little Czech republics or little Bulgarias, and they will all have to come to the West for money and and so we will you will get so so don't be our enemy because what we're doing we will make sure that if we win with your help we will pay you off handsomely for you so what you have here and of course by the way the businesses are torn part of them likes that idea they that image is attractive but their fear is that the neocons will fail and then they have nothing because then the Chinese, if they let them succeed, the Chinese, what are they going to do? Their only way to get back at the United States is to cut off the business. That's why they uh, stopped the export of uh, gallium and germanium and things like that. This is going to hurt businesses of various kinds. So the businesses find themselves caught and they don't know and they're split. Some business executives want to go one way, some another. And the neocons play those differences. 
and so that that's what you have to that's what's going on the verb don't be swayed by the verbiage the verbiage you know the united states cares officially about the the uyghurs as much as it does for groups all over the world that are discriminated against more or less in whatever society they are the selective uh, crocodile tears for this it, it is it's childish and it's silly you know it's as if xi jinping who would have much more right to do it excoriated the united states every day for the discrimination against african americans or hispanic americans you know he doesn't do it nobody does it. it the united states does it and it looks i really have to say that it looks somewhere between awful hypocritical and pathetic yeah i mean it's it, it's just one bad diplomatic etiquette you're not going to work with anyone uh, if you're interfering in their affairs and, and two yeah the hypocrisy is absolutely it's stark mind, and mind it's, and you know, it's, it's yeah. bad because diplomats say it the media says it uh i had a lot of contacts in europe they are literally I'm embarrassed by it i mean it's just it's awful it's awful and that that does not that does not fly without consequences it's a problem for the United States. Thank you for tuning in to my latest video. I appreciate all of your support. This channel, however, needs your help. I am seeking to make this channel more sustainable in the long term and upgrade necessary equipment to ensure that this work continues onward and makes progress to give you all of the geopolitical analysis that you all deserve. For that reason, I'm asking you to become a member of my Patreon community at patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. You can find that link in the video description or in the pinned comment below. For whatever amount you choose to give, just know you are supporting independent media that you can't find anywhere else. Thank you so much, and I look forward to the next video.